All right, so I spent the morning uh, writing for like the 50,000th time uh, about tobacco. And uh, I don't mind doing it, but I'd like to just do a video so then next time somebody asks me, I can just go, oh, here, watch this. Click on my ad. Um, anyway, uh, I wanted to give an uh, overview of uh, what I've learned in the years that I've been doing it. Here's what everybody's after. Uh, I hope you can read it. You may have to go full screen. It's the American blend. It is 15% uh, Virginia tobacco. It is 15% Turkish tobacco. And it is 70% Burley tobacco. And that's what everybody seems to be looking for when they're trying to grow their own tobacco. Uh, how can I have a cigarette that, you know, doesn't suck that I can make myself? And that's... Uh, that's the American blend. That's what's in a Marlboro. That's what's in a Camel. Uh, Lucky Strike. Now they've done variations on that. Uh, trade secret stuff. Because a third of a, a modern cigarette is a uh, paper-like product, tobacco-based, a lot of chemistry in it, uh, and it's shredded to resemble tobacco. And that's probably why everybody dies from cancer from smoking. You know, my guess. But what do I know? I'm just some guy with a chicken coop. Uh, the next thing to know is the most important thing to know, and that's this second little sign I've made here. I'll zoom in on those, and uh, you know, so that you know you can uh, remember what these say. I was hoping they'd be a little more effective, but I realized they're a little small. But that's life on YouTube. Uh, there's basically three types of tobacco. There's flu cure, which is Virginia tobacco. There is Sun Cure, which is Turkish tobacco, and there is Air Cure, which is Burley tobacco. And if you look into tobacco at all, you know that there are a lot of types of tobacco, but all of them come under one of those three headings. And that's the important thing to know about choosing a tobacco. I see people all the time buy, you know, some wild exotic tobacco, and I'm like, well, what are you going to do with that? You know, the most important part of selecting your tobacco is how am I going to cure that stuff? Uh, <laughs> I recommend everybody start out with Burley to get their uh, feet wet into curing because it is air cure. And the way that air curing is done is a simple uh, barn that has doors on the east and west ends. After you grow your tobacco, it's hung and then air passing through cures it. Um, what curing basically is if you think about the uh, leaves on a tree in the fall, they change colors. And that's the uh, starches converting to sugar in the leaf. And that's all you're doing when you're curing tobacco. You're just doing it into, in, a, in a controlled process so that you have some control over the end product so that it's something you actually want to smoke. Uh, like I said, air curing is the simplest way to go, um, followed probably by sun curing, which is a process you know, generally done in Turkey, uh, you know, but places in that part of the world where they actually grow Turkish tobacco. The pictures you've seen of uh, generally women uh, in a third world setting with these racks with strings full of uh, tobacco leaves, that's Turkish tobacco. And there's a lot of varieties of Turkish and it's considered the, the spice of a tobacco blend. Uh, you have a lot of control over what your tobacco is going to be by selecting your Turkish tobacco. Uh, in the American blend, I expect it's one of the more uh, common Turkish tobaccos like Samson or something like that. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. As far as uh, flu curing, that was the first one I tackled. And that's what this box right here is. is a, uh, it's a, basically just a lab oven that I've made a few changes to to make it suitable for flu curing tobacco. Um, there's a heating element in the bottom it actually had two, and the temperature range of this thing was double what's required for flu curing. Um, so I removed one of them. So I have a heating element with a fan in the bottom. I've got a vent in the top that uh, I can control humidity with. Um, I've actually got a bunch of di digital thermometers on the side where I did testing in the center of the leaves. Uh, I did testing at the bottom of the box, the top of the box to check all my temperatures. and. You know, there's a ton of information on flu curing available uh, from the industry, 
but it relates to huge tobacco barns and you really don't need to pay that much attention to what you're doing. Ideally, if you have a, a box capable of uh, running from 100 to 160, roughly, uh, being able to control it by just a, t a degree or two, you've got a flu carrying box uh, and being able to release the humidity. And ideally, it would have a window in it so you can just watch your tobacco. Uh, the uh, tricky part is to uh, maintain the, the movement uh, of the color. If you let the temperature get too high, the uh, leaves set green. And uh, I forget what the term for that is. Uh, if you uh, actually, I guess I, I, I said that one backwards. The, uh, if you let the temperature stay too low, they will eventually set green and be done. Uh, if you turn it up too high, they scorch and you basically just have a dried out nasty brown leaf. Uh, you're looking for a nice golden color. I've posted photographs all over of uh, the uh, end product out of this box and it's very nice. Um, and it wasn't, uh, I didn't monitor humidity, all of that. I just watched my leaves. Um, that pretty much covers um, curing tobacco. Uh, with the information of the, the terms of air curing, flu curing, and sun curing, you can um, pretty well find really specific information to how you're doing it available online. The tough part about uh, tobacco is it is such an industrial secret environment that you have to learn a lot of words just to find what you're looking for to learn anything about it. Uh, unless you want to do the humidity chamber styrofoam box thing, which I know nothing about. <laughs> uh, and I'm not convinced it works. My approach was to understand the history of tobacco, and that's how I did it. Uh, flu curing, for example, was invented by uh, a barn accidentally catching on fire. And when they went in to salvage the tobacco, they found out that they had really good tobacco. And flu curing was uh, After curing, what is necessary is fermentation. And, you know, there's going to have to be some kind of processing after you've cured your tobacco. In an air cure situation, for me, I like to hang it and then just leave it there. You know, I maintain it. You maintain your airflow by opening and closing your end doors. You just watch your tobacco and make sure that it's, you know, changing colors properly, not setting too fast or too slow. Uh, you let it sit in there until the fall rains come. Then your dried out leaves become supple as they take on moisture. And that puts you into the next phase, which is uh, fermentation. Uh, to ferment tobacco, uh, if you guys probably seen my other video and you've seen this box, uh, it's just a plug press that I made. This was uh, an experiment to uh, pressurize tobacco to cause it to ferment. I built the box. I took some, the best part of some leaves, folded it up, put it in here, put the lid on it. I built this simple clamp for clamping this uh, down to put some pressure on it. And really, it only has to stay in there for, geez, maybe an hour. Um, it's just not important to maintain that pressure for a long time because the pressure is built, the, the reaction happens. Um, now plugging tobacco isn't something I would want to do to an entire crop. And to me, the biggest crop I've ever run is 100 plants. And by the time you run 100 plants, you're going to be tired. So what I'm doing this season is just 10 burly plants, basically just to uh, show the process, um, which is unrelated to this video, but anyway. Uh, plug press. Very simple thing. It's an oak box. The uh, reason it's in an oak box is back to history. The uh, way it was discovered was that fermentation improved tobacco is back when they were uh, exporting from the colonies back to Europe tobacco. It would go on a ship voyage packed tightly in an oak cask. And people started coming back from Europe to, uh, to the colonies and would smoke uh, tobacco to find that uh, it wasn't as good as the European tobacco. So it, you know, stood to reason that it was because of the uh, fermentation in the uh, ship hole 
in an oak uh, casket, a lot of moisture down there, under pressure. They were fermenting the tobacco and didn't even know it. So, you know, that, that's progress in the classic sense. Uh, this piece here, this was uh, kind of an experimental piece. It's just two oak boards put together to, to make a clamp. And I was holding plugs in here when I was determining how long it was necessary to keep them under pressure uh, to cause fermentation and realize that for, for that purpose, this piece is not necessary. But what a, a piece like this is for, historically, is when they sold plug tobacco in the stores, it would be kept in the back between a couple of oak planks. And not under pressure, just the uh, wood helps to hold the moisture into the plug. See, so much of this is about holding, uh, holding moisture content, proper moisture content. So much of everything in the world is when you get back to a simple homestead life. You know, my cookies, they're in a cookie jar with a sealed lid because of humidity. And maintaining the proper amount of it. This right here is an old tobacco shredder. I picked it up a few weeks ago at a uh, antique store. The guy didn't know what it was. Just nobody knows what these are. Well, almost nobody. Uh, a lot more people will now, hopefully, because of my video. So share it with your friends. You can see what I've got here. Little square pegs all around it. It meets with cutter blades inside of the box. What happens, you take whole leaf tobacco after curing and put it in this little hopper on the top, turn the crank, it shreds it, and it drops it out the bottom. Now, then you've got, at that point, a bunch of uh, cured tobacco that is shredded, but it is not fermented. But hopefully it's got the right moisture content. You can pack it tightly into a container to cause fermentation. And that's how you get good tobacco. And I'll tell you what, in a nutshell, that's really about it. Uh, I'll follow up here in just a minute by showing you the inside of this flute here uh, box and show you how I hung the leaves. And don't forget this stuff right here. This is what you need to know to even get started, to get the ball rolling. Uh, this oven <laughs> has a really heavy door. Uh, wow, this just made my video perfect. You can see that it has a, a rack in it. This rack actually hangs up high. Actually hangs up high inside of the unit. And that's a temperature probe right there. Just because you do need to maintain your temperatures properly. And those temperatures are easy enough to find um, just with some Google searching on flu curing. The way that I uh, would hang my leaves on the, this, I would pack them tightly. I'd do three rows, three rows through here, and packing the stems tightly through here, and then I would just put a wire, or actually I guess I would pack the, the, uh, the leaves through this way, and then just run a wire through the stems, and do three rows and I could fit a lot of tobacco on there doing it that way. Uh, give you a close-up view while I'm trying to distract you from the fact that I just knocked over my flicker oven of this uh, shredder. You know, it's not rocket science, but it was in about 1890 when that thing was built. And in case you want to see it a little closer look at this thing, I just welded up this clamp. It is nothing special. And the box is just a box. I put the funky little lid on it just uh, to meet with the, the press, to meet the press. And uh, I'll generally uh, keep the, that box wet before I uh, do my pressing. Not actually, you know, water in it when I put the leaves in but just a, a wet box uh, due to the humidity so that the box itself will not draw the moisture out of my leaves. And let's see, unless I've missed anything, uh, that's tobacco in a nutshell.